This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University. And today I wanted to talk a little bit more about Bitcoin UTXOs, Bitcoin UTXO management, in particular, how to view your own Bitcoin UTXOs. I want to make this really explicit one more time so that everyone can learn how to do it. A UTXO, for those who haven't been following this series of videos, is just a chunk of Bitcoin that can still be spent. If you want to catch up, I will link to this playlist and you can watch the previous three videos because this is a pretty involved topic. Now, some stress and frustration around these videos. It's definitely a topic that takes some time to wrap your head around. It's an intermediate to advanced topic. So the sooner you learn about it, the better off. I think you'll be watch these videos a few times. And this is really important as well. Don't panic. Don't take any action before learning about all the trade-offs involved. The first step that everyone should take if you're having some sort of decision paralysis or feeling overwhelmed by this is just get to know your own UTXOs. That's it. Learn how to take a look at what UTXOs you are actually holding. So that's what we're going to review again today. I like using the Sparrow Wallet for this. I believe there's a way of doing it inside of Ledger Live or inside of the Trezor Suite. But any hardware wallet you have, you can probably connect it to the Sparrow Wallet, which is available for laptop or desktop. So the first step is just to download this free software, and I'll put a link in the description notes below. Make sure you're downloading it from the correct site. And if you follow my link, it'll be the correct site, but there are some fake sites that will give you a fake version of the software. So once you install it and open it up, it'll look like this. We'll go up here to preferences. We're gonna to go to server and we're gonna to connect to, right now it's connected to a, a public server, or public node, uh, bitaroo.net. You can also use it with your private node. Here's when I use it with my umbral. But for now, we're just gonna leave it at this public server. We are leaking a little bit of privacy. That's one thing to consider. That's one reason to run your own node. If we click test connection, it will show that we are connected to the Electrum, to Bitaroo's Electrum server. So then we're gonna close that. We're gonna go up here, new wallet. We'll call it test wallet three. We'll click create wallet. And now the next step is to import whatever hardware wallet you're using. It really does make a lot of sense to use a different software from the one that comes with your hardware wallet. So if you have a ledger, rather than using Ledger Live, use something like Sparrow. It gives you, it gives you really two layers of collusion that would be needed to try to interfere with your Bitcoin or steal data or something like this. If you're just using all Ledger products, including their software or all Trezor products, including Trezor Suite, then you don't have this protection. So this, this is a general lesson how to connect your hardware wallet to Sparrow and use it on your laptop or desktop to take a look at your UTXOs. So what I'm gonna do here, I'm not gonna do an air-gapped version this time. I'm just gonna do connected hardware wallet. I'm using a Blockstream Jade that is connected to uh, my desktop through a USB port. I'm gonna scan for what wallet's available. And now what I need to do is I actually need to unlock my Jade. So let me just enter the pin code on the front and I'll be back when I've done that. Okay, so now I entered my pin code into my Blockstream Jade and we're at this screen, the Jade has been opened up. So I'll just click import key store. And what this is doing, this is not sharing my private keys with Sparrow. The private keys stay on the hardware wallet, but what it is, doing is importing an XPUB and derivation path. And so the wallet will be able to follow the public addresses, uh, the Bitcoin address that are, that are generated. So now I'm just gonna click apply. I'm not gonna add a password. A password would just encrypt it on this machine. So feel free to do that. If you want to, that's different from the pin code on the hardware wallet itself. This would just be for the software here. So I'm gonna do no password. And then uh, I believe I'm all ready to go now. And so all the transactions would be up here. If you wanna send Bitcoin, you go here. If you wanna receive Bitcoin, you can copy the, use a fresh address here. And then down here is where you'll see your UTXOs uh, associated with this XPUB and with this hardware wallet. And you'll be able to see the list of them here. I don't have any in this particular hardware wallet. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip over to Testnet. What we can do is just go up here and click restart in Testnet. And this will allow you to use Sparrow with, uh, with fake Bitcoin on the Testnet network. And this was a, uh, a, a wallet that I showed before in a previous video. So I just wanted to flip over to here quickly to show you what UTXOs look like. These are all, these aren't BC1. These aren't real addresses. These are all testnet addresses. But you can see here, you have the ability to label where this Bitcoin comes from and where it's going. That's very important as part of UTXO management. You can see all the different addresses. If you've reused an address, you'll see a little white and red exclamation point. And then what you can do is you can can consolidate 
uh, transactions. You can consolidate UTXO. So each of these uh, right here, because we're under, the, we're under the UTXO tab, each of these is a chunk of Bitcoin. This is a 50,000 sat or Satoshi chunk of Bitcoin. This is 100,000 sats. This is 1,000 sats. And so if I wanted to perform a consolidation, the first thing I do is I would go over here to receive. I would copy this fresh address. I go over the two UTXOs and let's say I wanted to merge uh, both of, uh, well, let's use one of these, this one and this one. So I've selected the 50,000 sat UTXO and the 23,755 uh, sat UTXO. Remember, I just copied a receive address from here. Now what I'm gonna do is go over here to where it says send selected. I'm going to paste in that Bitcoin address. I'll label it by typing test consolidation and what we'll do is we'll just click max to UTXO selected. And we can see here there's a slider for the fee. So this is one thing I want you to do. If you're afraid of your UTXOs, you just get to know them in this way. You first check out, see which UTXOs you have, and then practice doing a test transaction or at least set it up. And this, this slider is a great way of practicing this. So we took two UTXOs. These probably should not be uh, combined because they come from different sources. But what we've done is we, we've built a Bitcoin transaction using them. And now we can pay, play around with the fees. So if we want the fees to be roughly, let's see where they are right now. Uh, if we go to mempool.space to get in the first block, they're about 95 sats per V byte. So if we want to assume this sort of environment, this sort of fee environment, we could slide this up to call it 95 sats per V byte, which is approximately approximately there, that's 96. And we can see that I will have, uh, in, under this transaction, it's gonna be fairly high fee. The fee will be 30% of the total. And so this gives you an idea, this might not be a very good idea to consolidate UTXOs at this at these fee rates. And then I'll get back 56,734 uh, sats after this consolidation. And so what's fun about this is you can do this. We can go back to UTXOs. You can consolidate a whole bunch of them. So in this case, I selected uh, five of them. I'll, I'll click send selected. Uh, we've got to do the receive address again. We'll go back over here. We will paste it in. We'll label it. And now we can see how the fees change based on. So if we go back, we can still do 95 sats per V byte. And we can see that the total fee is probably going to be higher because we have more inputs. We have five inputs instead of just two inputs. And so I think this is a great way of just getting to know your UTXOs, playing around with what fees look like in various environments. We can scroll up here to see at what point the UTXO is completely consumed by fees. At about 1700 sats per V-byte, we've basically burned up all the UTXOs just in terms of their fees. If I wanted to go ahead and do this transaction, what I would do is I would go over here, I would click create transaction, and then I would finalize for signing right here. And then I would just click sign and then broadcast it to the network. And if you're using a hardware wallet, this is actually a software wallet on this test net. But if you're using a hardware wallet, you would probably need to, um, you would need to sign the transaction on the hardware wallet. So I would encourage all of you who are afraid of UTXOs or just want to get started with this. This is a really nice way to learn how to use Sparrow just to play around with the different tabs as well as how to uh, view your UTXOs, look at receive addresses, send addresses, uh, see what Bitcoin addresses look like. If you're enjoying this video so far, I just ask you to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future topic, and share this video with a few friends. I would really help out the channel. Again, I will refer you to mempool.space to see where fees currently are, where fee rates are. They're currently at about 100 sats per V-byte to get in the next block. And for a typical 140 V-byte size transaction, this is about six or seven dollars. I do talk more about mempool.space in those previous videos. Again, three things to keep in mind when thinking about UTXO management, UTXO consolidation, present transaction fees versus what you expect future transaction fees or fee rates to be, both in sats and US dollars. And that's something you can play, play around with in Sparrow Wallet. You will pay more for transactions that have many inputs. So then the big question is, do you think now is a good low fee time? And I, I don't have any really good answers for this. I do expect fee rates to be continue to be quite volatile. And so now is probably an okay time. Uh, it's a little bit on the high side. It's much better if you can get this at 50 sats per V-byte or 20 or 30. But again, it's a little bit like Bitcoin's price. No one really has a crystal ball. But these are some of the things to keep in mind. Present transaction fees versus where you expect future transaction fees to be. 
And then the question is, should you do a UTXO consolidation, combine some of those UTXOs today, or wait uh, wait till Sunday night? Maybe there'll be less activity on the network, et cetera. That's the first thing, transaction fee levels. The second factor to take into, take into consideration is privacy. We talked about this, I believe, in yesterday's video, which is in that playlist I linked to. Merging unrelated UTXOs does associate them on chain. It may thus leak privacy. This is the quotes called the common input ownership heuristic. And it can be used really by anyone who's looking at the blockchain to say, look at all these transactions, look at all these UTXOs coming together. I believe that these are all, we're, we're all originally controlled by the same person. That's a probabilistic endeavor, but this is how chain surveillance companies and other people observing the blockchain think about these things. The third factor is future spending plans. What size UTXOs will you need? What size will your children or grandchildren need if they're going to spend some Bitcoin? There's, there are problems with one giant UTXO, which we were talking about yesterday in the private Bitcoin forum over at Bitcoin University. There is a question about consolidating all UTXOs. Is there any reason why one would not want to consolidate all UTXOs into a single output address. And my answer was this, it's probably best not to consolidate all of your UTXOs into one giant fat UTXO. The reason for this is leaking privacy in the future when you send or spend it. So let's say you end up with three Bitcoin in one giant single UTXO in the future. Let's say in the future, one Bitcoin equals a million dollars, that that much purchasing power, and you wanna spend one Bitcoin on a house or a high value purchase item like that. So you send this one Bitcoin to the seller of the house and you get the house, but the problem is here, the seller can just look up his own receive address and the transaction that you just made to send him that one Bitcoin, which you peeled off of this larger three Bitcoin UTXO. And the seller can see that original address had three Bitcoin in it. So they know that you probably still own two Bitcoin after buying the house. So this might expose you to some risks or at least gossip or certain privacy leaks. By contrast, if you had just a single one Bitcoin UTXO, in your wallet and then another two Bitcoin UTXO, you could have just sent over that one Bitcoin UTXO and the seller would have been none the wiser that you had those other two Bitcoin UTXOs. So it might, it might make sense to keep a few different denominations, quote unquote denominations. These are a little bit like physical dollar bills where you can have a $1 bill or a $5 bill or a $20 bill in your wallet. But the difference is UTXOs can be any size. They can be really, uh, they don't need to be round numbers, but you might wanna have some different denominations. And again, this depends on the size of your stash. If you're a Michael Saylor type account, maybe you have 100 Bitcoin UTXOs or something like this, or 1,000 Bitcoin UTXOs. Uh, but for I think for regular people, something like one Bitcoin, 0.5 Bitcoin, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, something like this. But you probably should keep your UTXOs at least a million Satoshis, so 1% of a Bitcoin. Hopefully that all makes sense. It really depends on your future plans for the Bitcoin, as well as any privacy mitigations tools that might come around in the future. And in this above example, as I talk about in the forum, I tell this person that they could also have coin joined that one Bitcoin to give them forward privacy, but that would still expose them to having to pay an on-chain fee at the time. If they did a coin join today, they'd have to pay wherever transaction fees are today. If they waited and wanted to get this forward privacy in the future before spending that one Bitcoin and buying the house, they would have to, doing a coin join, they would need to pay an on-chain transaction fee to the miners at that point, in addition to whatever the coin join coordinator fee is at the moment. So again, this is like any other calculation in life. Is it worth spending the money now? Should I wait? Is Are the transaction fees gonna be lower or higher? And these are very difficult things to answer. The main factors to keep in mind, transaction fee rates, privacy, and then future spending plans. What size UTXOs do you wanna have? And it, it definitely makes sense to organize these things when transaction fees are lower rather than when they are higher. I also wanted to highlight here a couple questions and answers that happened on YouTube. Uh, Cobody Special saying, so if I have a ton of UTXOs built up from years of dollar cost averaging, and I send all my Bitcoin from my hard wallet A to my hard wallet B, eating that painful transaction fee, does that consolidate them into one UTXO? My answer is yes, but you can do the same thing by sending all of those UTXOs to a single new receive address generated by that same hardware wallet A. You don't need two hardware wallets as we did in Sparrow. We went over here and we generated a fresh receive address. If we wanna get a fresh one, we can just click get new next address. We can copy it here and we can basically use that to send UTXOs to 
ourself and we don't need a separate hardware wallet for that. I go on to say I would wait for a lower fee environment to do this. Also may not be a good idea to consolidate everything into one big UTXO as it can create spending problems down the road regarding privacy, as we just spoke about. A clarification from the Immaculate J, SATs never truly become stranded even in a higher fee environment if you have other higher value non-stranded UTXOs that your stranded UTXOs can piggyback with to complete a send transaction. You'll pay a higher fee due to the increased inputs, but it's a way to rescue, unstrand the smaller UTXOs, even in higher fee timeframes environments. So what is the Immaculate J talking about here? I thought it was a really good point and I'm glad he brought it up because I was talking about UTXOs being stranded. So for example, we have we have a 50,000 sat UTXO here and let's say that transaction fees move up close to 50,000 sats. Maybe even if they're 10 or 20,000 sats, that's still a 20 or 40% uh, transaction fee, which is way too high. And so the Immaculate J does make a good point here that in itself, this UTXO, because it's only 50,000 sats, may become stranded. But if I'm able to combine it, if I do have a higher value UTXO, so for example, this 500,000 sat UTXO or this 5 million sat UTXO, I could then combine it with this 50,000 sat. These would be two inputs. So what I would do in this case, if I had this higher value UTXO, I would just uh, select both of them and then click send selected. And so in this case, this UTXO would not be stranded. But what I was talking about in that video is if you only had a 50,000 sat UTXO and you didn't have a higher value UTXO to pair with it. But I think one of the ways of answering these questions is again, you just get your hands dirty working with Sparrow and playing around with this combining UTXOs and seeing how it works and getting a feel for the fees. At the end of yesterday's video, I also talked about moving maybe some of your sats, moving them to Lightning for future spending. And there were a bunch of questions about the Moon Wallet. What about the Moon Wallet? Isn't it non-KYC? And you can use Lightning. My response is not a good wallet in a high fee environment because every Lightning transaction does a transaction on the base layer. Phoenix is better now. What Moon does is it does submarine swaps on chain and this is not good in a high fee environment or even a medium fee environment and so though i used to recommend moon and i look forward to seeing what they produce down the road if you're going to use a lightning wallet and we're going to be talking more about this in a subsequent video i recommend checking out phoenix you can download it for android or for ios on your phone really really cool wallet and we're going to investigate it probably in the next video talk about channel management talk about inbound liquidity and some of these more advanced lightning concepts if you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.